everyone! Welcome to episode number 597 of this here electronic engineering podcast called Amelia's Weekly Fish Fry. Brought to you by eejournal.com and written, produced, and hosted by me, Amelia Dalton. My guest today is Scott Poole from Airborne Connectors, and we're talking all about next-generation power systems, the challenges of low noise switching, and how Airborne is tackling the issues surrounding clean-conducted emissions. Also this week, I check out some teeny tiny batteries developed by a team of researchers at MIT that could help minuscule robots sense and respond to their environment. But first, please welcome Scott to Fish Fry. Hi, Scott. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Okay, so we're talking about Airborne's power systems today, but from my previous conversation with you guys, we talked about interconnect solutions. So why was power systems the topic of your discussion at Embedded Tech Trends this year? It's a great question. Most folks do not realize that Airborne is a very vertically integrated company. So we've been around since the 1950s, And everybody knows Airborne as a very reliable, rugged connector company. But is what they don't realize is with the vertical integration, where the connectors and the vertical food chain, if you will, advances to. So Airborne is very strong at taking the connector and turning it into the cable harness. And the cable harness, connectors go on circuit boards, if you will. Then the circuit boards turn into top-level assemblies. And one of the common themes is everything needs power. Mm -hmm. So Airborne was into the power distribution arena since the 1980s and in the early 2000s took that technology and really expanded into mill arrow and defense, not just power distribution, but power systems, period, embedded power systems. So Airborne's able to compete in a very unique space with the vertical integration from the connector all the way up through the circuit boards are all designed in-house. The manufacturing is all currently in the United States. We have flex circuits all the way up through the machine stampings and top-level boxes. So the power systems were naturally a great fit for that product portfolio. So you mentioned a list of things that Vita doesn't require. Can you go through that list for my audience? And what on that list keeps you awake at night? There's uh, Vita is very good at defining fit, form, and function, but there's a lot of areas that aren't defined within Vita or are very loosely defined within Vita. For example, efficiencies aren't specifically defined within Vita. So the example that we reviewed during the presentation today, and it was 90% efficient on a competitive system, which 90% most people would be happy with 90%. And we compared that against the airborne power blade, which is higher than 95%. So when we look at this, we think, well, it's only 5%, not a big deal. In reality, as what that says is we can double our output power from what a competitor can at 90% and still have the same level of power dissipation. So what we dissipate at 2,000 watts of output power, a competitor is dissipating at 1,000 watts. That's huge from a thermal management standpoint, from a thermal interface standpoint, and also from a performance standpoint. So in a system where multi-kilowatts of power are needed, we can imagine that we can actually reduce part counts and number of airborne power blades will be typically a much lower number than what our competitors have to supply to achieve the same power levels. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about low noise switching. What are you seeing here when it comes to modular approaches versus discrete approaches? Well, Airborne has been designing power for many, many years and has used a tremendous number of off-the-shelf power modules. And while it does satisfy the intent for the most part, there's a lot of work that has to be put around those power modules to make them compliant in a military or defense Mm -hmm. system. Mm -hmm. And so really the goal is to be able to 
get inside those modules, which if it's a package module, you cannot. So Airborne took the approach of designing our own power engine. And part of the power engine was really optimizing for performance, if you will. Fantastic. Now, you also mentioned clean conducted emissions. So can you talk about that a bit more and what is Airborne doing to address this issue? So conducted emissions, as well as all EMI requirements in a system, it's typically a requirement that's commonly shoved to the end of the line. Some of the last testing is typically done. But even if it's EMI testing is done at the beginning of a test routine, once qualification testing commences, it's lengthy, it's expensive, it's time consuming. And logistically, we've seen programs that have to load 18 wheelers to get the product to the test lab. Mm. So as you can imagine, the customer is going to want to go one time. And Airborne has really put a lot of emphasis with the power engine into reducing conducted emissions to a point that an external filter, we've been shown to be able to pass conducted emissions with no external filter, Mm -hmm. which is very, very uncommon in the industry. But with the attention to detail that we've put into the power engine, the conducted emissions being able to pass so clean and so easily under the limits has been the result of the painstaking work put into the power engine. So let's also talk about the sharing and parallelizing issue you brought up. Yep. So one of the very common issues that we see in the market was one of the issues that we wanted to target designing the power engines, and that was load sharing and paralleling of cards. One of the key parameters on the airborne blade is the fact that we can generate a couple thousand watts of power at very high rail temperatures or temperature levels. So we have a lot of applications where a supplier or a competitor is going to need two, three cards, the what we can do in one card. Mm -hmm. So in those cases, the sharing is not really that important. It's great for the end user because they're able to get rid of the sharing problem with one airborne blade versus two or three competitor blades. But in those applications where we have four and six and eight kilowatts of power required in a chassis, it's really important for those power blades themselves to be able to effectively share power how the end user wants it to be shared. Mm -hmm. For example, in a chassis, there's dead spots of airflow within a chassis. So if you, multiple cards are run in a chassis, there is going to be a delta T, if you will, across those cards. And each card is going to run at a different temperature. Just that problem alone, we've seen competitors get into thermal runaway problems. We know that the life expectancy of the card is going to decline dramatically if it's, say, a 10 degree rise warmer than its neighboring card is what that's resulted to in the past has been mechanically moving the cards around the chassis to try to balance lifespans. So we have that. We have issues with not being able to maintain communication and proper control of each card through a digital signal. If the digital signal it becomes corrupt, performance becomes very unknown, and it, it could be unsustainable, and it can end in damaged hardware. So Airborne has developed schemes within the firmware that is utilization of artificial intelligence. And through the artificial intelligence, the operator or the designer can instruct the system how it wants power dispatched. It can be load shared thermally. So each card is going to run at the same temperature. It could be equal power coming out of each card. It could be equal current coming out of each card. There's a lot of mechanisms that Airborne allows the end user to be able to leverage in order to get the system parameters to a point that is optimized for each application. So let's circle back, Scott, to the Airborne solutions and and how they address it, how they are addressing these issues. So Airborne has developed power engines and, if you will, power supplies that can be really adapted to a lot of different fit form and functions. But the primary target audience is in the Vita applications now. Airborne has introduced really five key parameters into these power engines, and that is a huge boost in efficiency. The second item is very clean switching. So we developed a power engine. So at the heart of the power supply is an engine that has all been internally developed. It has been simulated for 
many months and then built in a lab and then finally built in a manufacturing environment and tested. And it is almost textbook perfect, idealized as can be. The third would be the clean conducted emissions as we spoke about. So along with bullet point number two on the clean power engine, and the clean switching, the conducted emissions allows for very little harmonic content to be coupled out through the input cord, which by definition is what we're measuring as far as the conducted emissions. And then also on the output side, which is our fourth bullet point, it is very low noise and ripple. So in this case, Vita does require 120 millivolts of noise and ripple maximum. Our systems are an order of magnitude lower than what the requirements are. So when we talk to folks that are doing FPGA design work or microcontrollers in things that require very stable, yet very clean input power, there's no requirement for them to put a stage in front of their technology to be able to deal with the VITA requirements that may allow 120 millivolts, as an example. Mm -hmm. And then the fifth item would be the paralleling in, in the load share that we just spoke about. Fantastic. All right, before I let you go, Scott, it's time for your off the cuff. So if you could have one meal right now, it doesn't matter if it's on the other side of the world, the restaurant is closed, what would you have? I think I would have to go for uh, Cingale, which is uh, Italian wild boar. Oh, wow. I think that's the first time I've had that answer. Tell me more about that. It's, uh, it's wild boar in the, in the northern hills of Italy, and it is harvested properly and prepared properly. That and a cold beer will go a long ways. Excellent. Well, Scott, that was super cool. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Appreciate the opportunity. Have you heard about the battery that is smaller than a grain of sand? Developed by MIT engineers that can enable cell-sized autonomous robots? Let's get into it. So, these zinc air micro batteries, which are around 0 0.002 millimeters thick and 0 0.1 millimeters long, capture oxygen from the air and then use it to oxidize zinc, which can create a current up to a volt. And that is enough to power a sensor, actuator, or small circuit. So this micro battery research has been in the works for several years. Michael Strano, Carbon B. Dubs Professor of Chemical Engineering at MIT and his team have been working on tiny robots that can sense and respond to stimuli in their environment for quite some time. Now, one major challenge that they have encountered is making sure that these tiny robots have enough power. One solution to this problem is what is referred to as a marionette system. This is where solar power is used to power these tiny robots. But this system requires that a laser or other light source is pointed at them at all times. Putting a power source inside these tiny robots would allow them to roam much further because they wouldn't be controlled by an external power source. Michael Strano explains the challenges of these marionette systems like this. The marionette systems don't really need a battery because they're getting all the energy they need from outside. But if you want a small robot to be able to get into spaces that you couldn't access otherwise, it needs to have a greater level of autonomy. A battery is essential for something that's not going to be tethered to the outside world. So to create more autonomous robots, Strano's team decided to use zinc air batteries, which have a much longer lifespan than other types of batteries because of their high energy density. The specific battery that Strano's team developed consists of a zinc electrode, which is connected to a platinum electrode, embedded into a strip of a polymer called SU8. When these electrodes interact with oxygen molecules from the air, the zinc becomes oxidized and releases electrons that flow to the platinum electrode, 
creating a current. So, what can these bad boys do? Well, this research team was able to provide enough power with their zinc air batteries to power an actuator, and specifically a robotic arm that could be raised and lowered. They were also able to power a MEMS wrister, a clock circuit, and two different kinds of sensors that change their electrical resistance when they encounter chemicals in the environment. So, this research did use a wire to connect their battery to an external device. But in the future, they plan on building robots with these batteries already incorporated inside of them. Strano explains their plans for the future like this. This is going to form the core of a lot of our robotic efforts. You can build a robot around an energy source. Sort of like how you can build an electric car around the battery. Even cooler, this team is specifically looking at designing tiny robots that could be injected into the human body, where they could seek out a target site and then release a drug, such as insulin, and would be made out of biocompatible materials that would break apart once they are no longer needed. Wow. So if you want even more information about airborne connectors or this super cool zinc air micro battery research from MIT, I've included several links below the player on this week's fish frying page on eejournal.com and in the description for this week's YouTube episode as well. Hey, have you checked out EE Journal on social media yet? Well, you should. You can find us at facebook.com slash EE Journal. If you're into X, you can monitor our tweets at EE Journal TFM. And don't forget, if you would like to follow my personal account, check out Amelia D. 1978. And hey, if LinkedIn is more your thing, I dig it. You can follow us or me on LinkedIn as well. And we are also on Blue Sky Social and Mastodon too. And we have a YouTube channel, youtube.com slash eejournal. Folks, it is chock full of all kinds of techie videos, including our very popular Chalk Talk webcast series hosted by me and our new animated series called Libby's Lab. And of course, you can subscribe to our EE Journal YouTube channel as well. Also, make sure that you subscribe to this here podcast on Spotify, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, or just about any other podcasting platform to listen to some exciting upcoming episodes, including my 600th episode coming up in just a couple weeks. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. If you know of any cool new technology or heck you just want to chat, shoot me a line at Amelia, that's A-M-E-L-I-A, at eejournal.com, or post a comment on our forums on EE Journal. For the week of August 30th, 2024, I'm Amelia Dalton, and you've been fried.